Welcome back, everyone, to Salt Talks. My name is Jason Zins. I'm a partner at Skybridge Capital. Uh, as most of you know, SALT is a global thought leadership and networking forum encompassing finance, technology, and politics. SALT Talks is a series of digital interviews with the world's foremost investors, creators, and thinkers. Just as we do at our global SALT events, we aim to both empower big, important ideas and provide our audience uh, a window into the minds of subject matter experts. And so today we have a Subject matter expert and uh, and business builder extraordinaire Zach Prince, the CEO and founder of BlockFi. Um, quickly on uh, on Zach's background and biography, Zach is the founder and CEO of BlockFi, a crypto financial services company founded in 2017 with Flory Marquez. With experience in multiple leadership roles at successful tech companies, his career started in ad tech where he was a part of two successful acquisitions, AdMeld, which was acquired by Google, and Sociomantic, acquired by Dunhumby. Prior to starting BlockFi, he led business development teams at Orchard Platform, a broker-dealer and RIA in the online lending sector, and Zibi, an online consumer lender. Zach graduated cum laude from Texas State University with a BA in international business and a minor in Spanish. Uh, so Zach, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, familiar face with us as well, uh, of course, our host uh, for this SALT talk, Anthony Scaramucci. A familiar face. You're like worse than John Darcy, the other host. I'm a familiar. See, Zach, you millennials, you give us a hard time, okay? I like I like having baby boomers on this show, okay, so we can team up against you people. So, so Zach, I want to get right into it with you. Jason's going to uh, feather in some questions towards the end, but I want to talk about your upbringing, if you don't mind. Uh, what'd your mom, dad do? How did you end up where you are at BlockFi? Tell us that odyssey. And because uh, I know when you were in junior high school somewhere, you didn't think you were going to be the founder and CEO of BlockFi. So, okay, tell us what happened. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, I grew up in South Texas. I was always a uh, very competitive um, athlete, and ultimately spent the most time as a, a tennis player. Um, and I was uh, nationally ranked. I used to travel around the country. Uh, on weekends competing, uh, you know, in, in junior tournaments across the U.S. Um, I was always really financially minded growing up. I actually asked my parents for, you know, stocks for Christmas when I was 10, but my parents were not particularly financially minded. We were, we were middle class and I was very comfortable, but, um, you know, they didn't give me stocks. And so anyway, so fast forward to college, I put myself through school as a semi-professional uh, online poker player. I was fortunate to come out of school with no debt. Um, and I always anticipated working in the financial services industry, but I finished school in May of 2009. Uh, so it wasn't, wasn't the best time to be, uh, looking for entry level roles in financial services. I ended up working at a advertising technology company and I was, you know, employee number 15. Um, and it was, uh, just a tremendous experience. Had three years after I joined, we were 250 people acquired by Google at the time. It was the sixth largest acquisition in, in Google's, uh, history, and after transitioning to Google, I realized that I really enjoyed building things and working on small teams. It took me about six months to completely lose my mind at Google with just the size of the org and everything that was going on. Um, so I left Google, went to another startup, uh, launched uh, the North American version of a German-based ad tech company. That was successful and acquired. And then after that, most relevantly for BlockFi, I moved into the online lending sector and the alternative credit sector. And uh, while I was working in that sector, I started personally investing in cryptocurrency in 2015. Well, let me let me stop you right there, though, because yeah. I want the eureka moment. You start investing in cryptocurrency in 2015. Why and where was your eureka moment? So I was um, I was actually writing a blog on the on the side. I was working at this company called Orchard, and we were the largest provider of data and technology tools to institutions that were either buying loans or directly financing online lending platforms. And so I was seeing all of this really interesting stuff: online consumer loans, online real estate loans, uh, and also more broadly in fintech, robo advisors were getting created. And I kind of became the fintech guy in my friend group. And I decided to start just writing some of this stuff down. You know, should you invest in fractional shares of commercial real estate online? Should you consider using a robo advisor? Should you be you know, participating in credit markets on some of these online lending platforms? And writing that blog led me to discover Bitcoin. And what really struck me about it initially was a lot of the things that happen in fintech 
are kind of a new front end on top of the same core infrastructure that has powered the financial system for a long time. And I thought it was really interesting how Bitcoin was not only a new technology that enabled a new payment rail, but also a completely new investable asset that, you know, if uh, if things worked out for it, could potentially uh, be very, very successful in terms of, you know, performance financially, but also have a positive impact on the world. And so I initially just took a flyer on it and was recommending on this tiny blog that I had that probably 10 people read uh, that people should create a Coinbase account and, and buy some Bitcoin. I ultimately completely whiffed it in 2015. I originally bought Bitcoin around 200. I sold the majority of my Bitcoin at 600 and thought I was just such a genius you know, Bitcoin trader uh, and ended up buying more later. Um, but that's what led me to it originally. And then I learned about Ethereum in 2016, made an analogy in my head that maybe Bitcoin is a little bit like a BlackBerry, Ethereum is a little bit like an iPhone. So I bought a ton of Ethereum. Um, Ethereum, you know, for like six months after I owned it was a horrible investment, down 50, 60 percent because there was this DAO hack. And, uh, you know, it was all very scary at that time. You had to send your money off of Coinbase, didn't know what was going on. But then in late 2016, uh, the prices started doing well. I had started going to meetups in New York City because at a certain point, my wife said, you're talking about cryptocurrency with me and I love you, but I don't want to talk about <laughs> cryptocurrency. <laughs> uh, so she's like, you can have Tuesday nights, um, go find some other nerds or whatever to talk about uh, cryptocurrency with. And those meetups, initially, it was like 10 people at a sleepy bar in Union Square, uh, you know, just nerding out over cryptocurrency. But by the first quarter and second quarter of 2017, it had started to gather some real momentum. And there were, you know, big law firms hosting 500 person meetups in, in midtown Manhattan. And there's a line of 200 people outside because there wasn't enough room to get in. So it was clear that this was becoming uh, very, very real. And in one of those meetups, I said to somebody, I've been working in online lending. I think there's going to be a need in this asset class for people to finance Bitcoin and, and other assets. And I, I think I'm in a great position to do it because I've been working in the alternative debt and credit markets for the last five years. Do you think it's a good idea? And this person at the meetup was like, that, that's the best idea I've ever heard. You need to start this business yesterday. <laughs> so uh, basically, I went home that night and, and told my wife the idea and uh, quit my, you know, put in my resignation at the fintech company I was working at like uh, the next day. Yeah, I absolutely love this story. So I want to take you to the elevator here at Skybridge. Now, we're on the fourth floor, but let's pretend we're on the 60th floor for this conversation I want the elevator pitch. So we're coming down the elevator. I open up the elevator. There's Zach Prince. Tell me about BlockFi. And now we're moving down the elevator. Sure. So uh, we're a financial services platform for crypto investors and crypto market participants. We have a retail facing side of our platform where you can earn interest on your cryptocurrencies. You can buy and sell cryptocurrencies and you can get a loan secured by the value of your portfolio. We're also launching our fourth product on the retail side imminently. It's a Bitcoin rewards credit card. You can earn Bitcoin with every dollar that you spend on the card instead of airline miles or regular cash back. And then we have an institutional side of our platform where we're effectively a, a prime broker for the asset class. And we work with market making firms, proprietary trading firms, hedge funds, and other types of institutions to finance their activities in the cryptocurrency markets and also to provide uh, best execution uh, and you know, facilitate their participation in the trading markets without them having to go up and set up you know, connections on all the va various venues themselves. So, so and uh, brilliant stuff. And I can't wait to get that credit card in my hands. And uh, just want you to know, I have a very high credit score. Just want to point that out to everybody on Salt Talks. But I want to ask you this. I'm going to move millions of dollars of Bitcoin to you is my Bitcoin safe and secure on BlockFi? And if it is, tell us why. It's absolutely safe and secure. So a couple of things that I would highlight. First off, we work with the best custodians in the industry. Fidelity, Gemini, and BitGo are the core of our you know, custody stack. Um, additionally, we have a risk management layer that not only is incredibly sophisticated, but has also been battle tested. We made our first loan in January of 2018 
And we've been active in this market at increasing scale throughout lots of periods of volatility. We've never lost a penny across India of the lending that we do. Additionally, with the exact business model that BlockFi has, we're the only company that's domiciled and fully regulated in the U.S. and has the backing of you know phenomenal uh, institutional uh, investors who uh, go very deep uh, in terms of understanding how everything works at BlockFi before deciding to invest in our platform. And we've raised uh, quite quite a bit of money, and we have a very very strong balance sheet. Okay, so now I've got my you've got me convinced. I've moved my millions of dollars over to. The, to to you, my Bitcoin, I should say, in nominal dollars. Uh, and how much could I earn on my Bitcoin when on that block fight? Yeah, and uh, just just to be clear, you could. We're increasingly seeing folks not only use our platform to earn interest on cryptocurrencies, but also to earn interest on stable coins, which I think of as just digital dollars. They're one to one interchangeable with dollars in a bank account on our platform, and the rates for all of them are very attractive. So. On stable coins today, folks are earning 7%. On Bitcoin, they're earning 4%. And on on Ethereum, they're earning 4.5%. Okay, so those rates sound high to the traditional finance. When we see lower rates and my checking account is zero at the such and such bank, and maybe I'm at 90 basis points on my CD, Zach, my my three-year CD is earning me 90 basis points in fiat currency that's being devalued by the minute due to the printing press. So how am I getting 7% from you? You said, look, the fundamental reason that these high yields exist on platforms like ours is that we're able to charge high rates when we're you know, lending out the capital that our clients are holding on our platform. And the reason we're able to do that is that the cryptocurrency sector does not, it's not connected to the traditional financial system particularly well right now. And the implication of that is that cryptocurrency companies, cryptocurrency trading firms, they're not accessing the traditional debt and credit markets from banks. And so therefore they have a higher cost of capital, which they're accessing through firms like BlockFi. So, you know, one analogy that I tell folks that that resonates with some people is, you know, there's publicly traded REITs, one, uh, one that's called Innovative Industrial Properties as an example. And they basically have warehouses where they allow uh, cannabis growers in uh, states that have legalized cannabis uh, growing. Um, They do triple net leases for them and they charge like 15 percent. A triple net lease, if you were growing carrots or if you were, you know, a normal uh, franchise store is going to be, you know, LIBOR plus two and a half percent. But it's way more expensive. The cryptocurrency industry faces that same fundamental problem of being early, not having access to traditional debt and credit markets. As a result, the cost of capital is high. We enable folks to participate in that. And the good news here is that the majority of the lending that we're doing is over collateralized with liquid assets. So on the spectrum of lending risk, we're on the low, low, low end uh, of the spectrum with the types of loans that we're making. And that's why we've had the perfect performance uh, that, that we've had on our platform today. So, so, so that brings my next question. So, I've now got my millions of dollars of Bitcoin over there, and I want to borrow against it. So, let's say a million dollars. How much would you lend me on my uh, Bitcoin account at Bit BlockFi? So, you can borrow up to fifty percent of the value of the assets that you hold at BlockFi. So, if you have a million dollars worth of uh, worth of Bitcoin. Um, you're going to be able to borrow half a million dollars secured by that million dollars worth of Bitcoin. And what am I paying in a percentage of interest right now? So uh, we have three pricing options. You can borrow at a 50% LTV, 35% LTV, or a 20% LTV. At a 50% LTV, the interest rate is 9.75%. And depending on the loan size, there's also an origination fee which can range from 50 bips up to 2%. Okay, so it's a fairly high yield, but uh, if you're a big Bitcoin believer and you wanna have a leverage play on Bitcoin, you're, you're one of the great places to go for this. What am I missing? That's right, it's safe and secure. And you know, importantly, in terms of tax optimization, if you're someone that's bullish on the future price of Bitcoin, and you have a large embedded capital gain in that position, as a lot of folks in this space do, because Bitcoin has been an incredible uh, you know, asset in terms of investment performance. Just not having to sell and realize that uh, you know, tax consequence is incredibly valuable. 
if you're, if you're someone like me that, you know, lives in New York, that's, you know, that's 35% that you're saving by not selling uh, and you still have the position. Um, it, furthermore, to the extent that you use the proceeds of the loan to make other investments, which the majority of our clients do, this is kind of like a, a high net worth type of borrowing. You can typically deduct the interest that you're charged on the loan using the investment uh, interest expense deduction uh, for your taxes. So it's, it's a very common wealth management tool. We're just making it available for cryptocurrency investors. So, Zach, you've got you built this colossal company. The uh, Bitcoin was down in the month of May. It was arguably the biggest month loss, month to date loss, if you will. Uh, and yet your company did phenomenally well in the month of May. Why is that? Uh, I, I think there's a few reasons. So, you know, different products on our platform uh, behave differently to market conditions. So, you know, to give you an example, um, trading on our platform typically correlates really tightly with volatility. If there's volatility, there's a lot of trading volume. Uh, U.S. dollar borrowing uh, is not as active when market sentiment is bearish and performance is bearish like it was recently. But Bitcoin borrowing, which is something that we're also uh, very active in, increases when market sentiment uh, is bearish. So different products react differently to uh, market conditions. Um, also, I think that our products are still relatively early in terms of everyone, even just in the cryptocurrency market, understanding that they're available and accessing them. And I'll give you one stat just to recognize that Coinbase has... 55 million retail accounts. BlockFi has uh, about 450,000 retail accounts today. So we're still pretty early uh, in terms of just letting people know that you know there's a platform where you can do these things. And then lastly, despite the day-to-day -day price fluctuations of uh, you know cryptocurrencies, this sector is in a long-term secular growth trend. Uh, so there are new people coming in all of the time. There are new business opportunities all of the time. And we're launching new products all of the time. We, we shipped our first credit cards last month uh, to, to employees uh, and a couple of um, uh, you know friends and family and influencers, and we'll be rolling them out publicly this month. Uh, I didn't get my credit card application yet, Zach. Am I, am I still considered one of the friends and family, I'm hoping, or, or no? You absolutely are. You, you, you'll be you'll be posting a picture with the credit card potentially before this podcast uh, or this show. Okay. I, all right, I cannot wait for that actually because I I want to I want to spend and earn Bitcoin when I'm spending. So so Zach, you you you're in twenty. We're gonna fast forward now. We're in twenty twenty six. It's five years from today. Where is BlockFi? What's the price of Bitcoin? By the way, we're gonna ask you to play a guessing game with us. And where is BlockFi? 2026, I would say Bitcoin's between uh, two and 300,000. Um, BlockFi is uh, doing all of the same things that, uh, that we're doing today. And we have continued to launch additional products that both make our platform more valuable to the clients that we already have, who are primarily you know, crypto investors and crypto market participants but also take this uh, financial services infrastructure that we've built in the crypto ecosystem and apply it to other areas of traditional financial services. So, so what does that mean? Well, we're launching a Bitcoin rewards credit card. That's our first product in the payments category. The payments category is one that we're gonna be very active in uh, on the retail side of our platform. So we're gonna be launching a debit card, peer-to-peer -peer payment functionality, and more on and off ramps so that our clients both in and outside the US are able to easily transition between a traditional bank account or a fintech platform where they hold funds like PayPal uh, and the BlockFi ecosystem. And ultimately the impact that I expect we'll have there and that the entire industry will have there is financial services are gonna be better, faster and cheaper and, and more accessible for global consumers. Um, and, and I think that's a, a very, very powerful uh, impact that this industry is going to have on the world. And BlockFi will be a, a significant part of that. And then on the institutional side of our platform, clients will be using us for uh, a lot more types of activities than what they are today. 
Uh, right now, we're mainly offering the ability for folks to trade the spot market, but we're going to expand into derivatives. And I think there might be uh, parallels in markets like commodities in FX, uh, where some of the infrastructure that we've built out for crypto can also be applied for some of our uh, institutional clients. So thematically, continuing to accelerate and do more things on the crypto side of the platform, but also expanding more into what we think of today as traditional financial services. I ultimately think crypto, fintech, and traditional finance is all going to merge and BlockFi is you know, part of that story in terms of what you'll see from us in 2026. All right, well, I, I appreciate you being on Salt Talks. I would be remiss if I didn't include my erstwhile partner, Jason Zins, who I think shaved three days ago, okay? And, and he knows I'm like George Steinbrenner, okay? So I want people clean shaven. Zach, you can do anything you want, okay? You're doing a beautiful job at uh, BlockFi. I'm a proud investor, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting my credit card. Uh, and go ahead, Mr. Zins. I know you've got questions that you were thinking about for Mr. Prince. Uh, th- thank you, Anthony. I, I did this to get you going so the, the public can see, you know, the, the real you. You're, you're hard on us sometimes. But uh, uh, I, I, I'm dem- I'm a very demanding boss, Zach. But then again, I I don't ask them to do anything I wouldn't do myself. And and the HR director, if I have a problem. Rather I am. Yes. Yeah, so if there's a problem at Skybridge, I'm the personnel director, Zach. So they have to they have to put the uh, suggestions in the suggestion box right here by the Muhammad Ali portrait. Okay, I, I put those, I set those on fire at 4.30. Okay, we had a little burning <laughs> ceremony. Go ahead, Mr. Zins, go ahead. So, Zach, I want to pick up on one of the points you ended on, which is sort of bridging the gap between the crypto ecosystem and the traditional financial ecosystem. Um, and one, I want to commend you for it, because I, I think a lot of times these days, in the Bitcoin community, in the crypto community, it's sort of us versus them. Um, whereas I think longer term, to your point, um, where Bitcoin is headed and where we really think the the, the value is, is, is more engagement, more adoption. And so I think, um, I, again, I want to commend you on, on helping to try and bring it mainstream. Um, now, the flip side to that, though, is, is you know, we're, we're five years from now, it's 2026, you guys have executed on your plan. You're then playing in in the you know the sandbox with the big banks, so everyone sees the announcements from Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. But but you you probably have some special insight here. Where do you think the banks are as it, as it relates to supporting crypto in in some of the manner that that you guys already are doing? Yeah, so I think um, uh, they're definitely more interested in making more progress today than they were last year or the year before or the year before. Um, They are absolutely starting to do things, uh, some banks faster than others. Um, And and I think that's a trend that's going to continue uh, because the the opportunity in the sector is only going to uh, continue to go up and uh, they have to be here because if they're not, then their clients are gonna be doing uh, these activities with, with other folks. That being said, there is a tremendous lack of clarity from a regulatory perspective in a way that a bank would need clarity to do all of the things that a company like BlockFi does. And these aren't companies that you know, turn on a dime and, and launch new products and, and technologies really seamlessly. It's, that's, not, that's not one of the strengths that we would describe banks as, as having as you know, nimbleness and speed. So what we're starting to see is two things today. One, uh, asset management products being added to the wealth platforms. Uh, so, you know, uh, I believe it was Morgan Stanley uh, that's that's added a couple of funds. Uh, I'm sure others will, you know, follow. Uh, and, and folks like um, Goldman uh, are starting to get active in, in cash settled derivatives uh, or uh, clearing futures for some of their, you know, pre-existing clients. Um, ultimately, I think that all of these things are great for the sector. It, it all ties into the theme of accessibility and access and financing. And in fact, there are things that I anticipate BlockFi will be doing uh, with some of the major banks in terms of partnerships or us being a client of theirs or even you know vice versa, depending on uh, the scenario. If we are not able to, at BlockFi, stay ahead of the curve relative to banks in terms of how fast they're building solutions, 
uh, and, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, if you start cash, uh, you know, clearing cash settled Bitcoin futures, um, you're probably still a ways away from being able to do that on the cryptocurrencies number two through 10 in the market cap stack. Well, that's not the case for a platform like BlockFi. You're probably not close to offering your clients the ability to participate in staking or, you know, the different uh, global markets around the world. And then on the retail side, um, look, they're even farther away from doing anything uh, on retail that has tremendous regulatory and, and political ramifications. And ultimately, all of the great fintech companies that we know today have been created during periods of time where, you know, the banks were perfectly capable in theory of competing with them. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of massive companies have been built. So uh, I think we'll have an edge there in terms of technology and client service and just being on the front foot of innovation and, and user experience with our uh, platform. So we're in a good spot. We welcome their participation and it's definitely going to only increase as time goes on. Great. Well, uh, I think, you know, one of the many aspects of your business that, that, that I find so impressive is, is how in, in such a short period of time, you've rolled out and successfully rolled out all of these new products. So um, certainly, uh, you know, seems like you're, you're, you're continuing to, to stay ahead of the curve. Um, I do want to pick up on, on the regulatory side, because that's sort of synonymous when anyone is talking about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. So give us the, the high level lay of the land on the regulatory side as it relates to BlockFi specifically, um, and then just the broader ecosystem. Sure. So BlockFi specifically, we're uh, a MSB money services business at the federal level. So that's your KYC, AML type uh, regulations. And then we hold money transmission and lending licenses at the state level. Um, we are, you know, always evaluating ways that could uh, uh, enhance um, our regulatory positioning. Uh, so, and, and this is something that happens with lots of fintech companies. Um, so just to use Square as an example, uh, in the early days of Square, they had a materially similar setup to the setup that BlockFi has today. Uh, over the last couple of years, they made progress on uh, creating a new bank in Utah. Um, and so whether BlockFi, you know, over the short or medium term makes it all the way to that bank step, or we end up somewhere in the middle uh, remains TBD. There are things that we're working on there. Um, and we do expect that there will be a progression over time. Uh, but every license we've ever applied for, we've received. Oftentimes, these are, you know, licenses where we're the first company ever getting this type of license for this type of activity. And so there's a lot of engagement and education that we do with the regulators. And overall, I think we've struck a, a very, um, you know, reasonable uh, approach to the industry to date in the U.S. And, and finding an appropriate balance between facilitating innovation uh, enabling the sector to, you know, get created and, and thrive and trying to, you know, tamp out things when they're too far in the, in, in the deep end. Uh, I would, I would be remiss not to say that we, we still have a ton of work to do, uh, as an industry. Um, you know, there are things that are just, uh, laughably bad today. You know, for example, the treatment of, Cryptocurrencies on a balance sheet under the public company, you know, accounting rules, not being able to mark them at fair value is, uh, in, in my humble opinion, quite absurd and something that uh, probably everyone in the industry can rally around as a as a area that needs some change. Um, and uh, there are still a few things that need to get you know sorted out um, with the SEC in terms of uh, clearer definitions around tokens or why we don't have. Uh, you know, a green light for a Bitcoin ETF yet. Um, I think those are probably two, two of the biggest things that, uh, you know, that are important for us to work on as an industry with regulators in, in the near future. But um, overall, I, I've been relatively uh, happy with, with how we've let things play out. And I think that um, the U.S. ultimately will stay true to, to form in terms of uh, being a place where we want to you know, facilitate innovation. We want to have these new high growth, high technology, high impact uh, industries be, you know, built and, and uh, domiciled uh, here because it's great for the economy. So it, it sounds like your your philosophy or your view is, is really to embrace regulation or at least work with the regulators 
as opposed to try and operate in in these gray areas that may exist out there. Absolutely. Um, and, and look, even even if you're operating, uh, even if there's something that's a gray area, that doesn't mean um, that, that you shouldn't engage. Uh, and, and I think that's part of our DNA at BlockFi and that it's that DNA comes from a traditional fintech. Um, there, there are numerous stories uh, in, you know, fintech corporate development and, and other industries in fintech that experienced a big boom and uh, consolidation and maturation over time as an industry where striking that right balance and, and, the, and it always is a, a balance um, uh, separates, you know, the leaders from the folks that ultimately end up not being in positions one, two or three in a, in a particular category. So. Great. Well, I think we're getting towards the end of our time. I know on, uh, on Twitter, of course, as I'm sure you've seen, everyone's asking for what, when they're getting their credit card. Do you, can you, can you tell us anything when, when, when I'm, we I'm getting my it. credit card right after this podcast. I mean, right after the small talk of that, I know. We have a waiting list uh, for, for folks who aren't named Anthony Scaramucci. Oh, and, well, and I'm hugging you. As an investor, uh, we, we have a waiting list with a little over 400,000 people on it. What I can say is that by the time this airs, if it is indeed, you know, till the 7th, um, we will be taking folks off of that public waiting list. We won't be fully through the waiting list, but we will have launched it. And, and the folks on the, uh, you know, on the lower numbers, like the first couple thousands at least of the waiting list will be getting their cards. And then we're gonna work through the waiting list as quickly as we can. And by, you know, August, September of this year, we're gonna be doing a ton of fun marketing. If you're flying around a major airport, you'll probably see ads talking about, you know, airline points are worthless. You should be earning Bitcoin. And we're gonna go big with it and have a lot of fun. All right, well, I'm going to be spending all, right. all my money on my BlockFi credit card, Zach. I just want to make sure you know that. Zins, can you call the Lambo dealer, please, okay, and find out if they accept BlockFi Visa? Can you call them for me after this? It, it's a Visa card. So, you know, you tell me, Zach, I assume it can be used anywhere Visa is accepted, as they say on the commercials. That's right. It's everywhere right. Visa is accepted. Anthony, we'll uh, we everyone saw the pictures of you in the Lambo, Anthony. We, okay. we saw them on Twitter, but let's wait. I, wait I, I, I had an by, by the way, it was a rented car. Okay, I know everyone goes crazy, you know, with the hating and everything, but I did get an orange colored car for the weekend, Zach, because I thought it was it was Bitcoin orange, Zach. I thought that was beautiful. Unfortunately, I'm nowhere near as cool as you on the car front. Like we literally have we're, we have a. We have two Kias. <laughs> like right, well, let me let me say, anytime you want to come over to the Scaramucci house, because you know we're Italian, we got to have cars. Everybody's got to have a car in the family. So yeah. anytime you want to come over, drive any of the cars, you're welcome to. But something tells me you're not going to need to do that. You're an amazing entrepreneur. You've got incredible commercial instincts, and I think one of the hallmarks of your success, uh, in addition to your charm and your salesmanship, is your adaptability. The way you've move for your, through your career and position this company. Uh, I'm just looking forward to your future and uh, being a, a shareholder, I'm super proud of everything you're doing. And so thank you for joining Salt Talks. And uh, we'll see you soon, Zach. You got to come to the uh, Salt Conference. I'm expecting you there. All right, I'm, Thanks, expect, I'm we'll, expecting we'll be you there. have a kiosk with the we, uh, we have a booth. BlockFi Visa. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think we're a sponsor with a booth. The team yeah, will be there. I'm we'll looking be there forward to handing out BlockFi Visa applications to all my friends and delegates. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks so happy, much for having me, guys. Happy 4th, my Thanks, friend. Zach, that was great. Appreciate it. 